Hey, good evening, church. How are you? Hey, I just want to throw a little, uh, before we get started, I want to throw a little add in again. You saw earlier in the beginning of the service this Reconnect Marriage uh, Conference and the, the, the program they're going to have here at the church. I can't emphasize enough how incredibly important it is for you to give that a consideration. Um, Amy and I have been married for 25 years this coming August, and I will tell you it's been the best 18 years of our life. Um, you can do the math if you like. You know, when you get married, you have to figure things out with each other a little bit. And we found out that we were both pretty selfish people and very self-centered. And we went to a marriage conference led by a guy named Dr. Danny Aiken uh, years ago, and it just changed everything for us. Uh, I just can't emphasize enough the importance of it. It doesn't matter where you're at in the stage of your relationship, good, bad, or ugly. It's a great thing to attend. So please give that your consideration. So here we are, week three, going through the book of Romans. And we started out talking about Romans chapter 9. We were looking at the sovereignty of God and his election. Last week, we had the opportunity to look at just, just the amazing uh, work of God that he does in Romans chapter 10, and that if anyone calls upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. We, we, that's grace, man. That's absolute amazing grace. And so what we're going to look at tonight, and I will tell you this is challenging because we're going to look at the majesty of God. We're going to look at literally the majesty of God. If you have your Bibles, turn to me to Romans chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 33 through 36. As you're turning there, I just want to kind of preface what we're going to talk about. I will tell you that I think I'm absolutely inadequate to, t to talk about the majesty of God. I, I can only tell you from my perspective, and I can only tell you from what God's Word says about how awesome and glorious He is. But unless you experience God in a personal way, you'll never fully grasp God's majesty. And even as a believer, and even for someone like me who, who struggles to search His Word and to study it and, and to faithfully proclaim it, I still don't think I can do just service to God's majesty. I mean, he's absolutely holy, he's absolutely glorious, and he's perfect, and he's good, and he's righteous. I mean, he's absolutely everything that we can't even comprehend. That's how awesome and amazing God is. If you're to look for definitions of majesty, it talks about the sovereignty or someone with power. I was raised, my mom's an English citizen, and we were raised to understand who the queen was. And her majesty, matter of fact, I've, I've worked with some of the, the British forces on multiple deployments and I came across the Navy and they have their ships, the HMS, Her Majesty's ships. They ascribe majesty to her because of her royalty. But when we look at the majesty of God, we're looking at him in all of his glory and all of his sovereignty and all of his power. And that's what happens in this passage. Paul has been writing to this Roman church, talking about the glory of God, and he finally just hits his point. He's like, oh, God, you are absolutely amazing. And so that's what we're going to look at tonight. So if you can, stand with me. We're just going to read this few verses together. Romans chapter 11, verse 33 through 36. This is Paul writing about the depth and the awesomeness of God. He goes, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who, is, who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all thanks to him be the glory forever. Amen. God bless his holy word. Please take your seat. Make yourself comfortable. Majesty of God. I mean, here's, here's Paul writing. And, and think about it again, and we'll go over this again just as we have the last couple of weeks. The first couple of chapters, he talks about sin, then he talks about how we're forgiven from sin, he talks about what we're free from when we're saved, and he talks about the sovereignty of God, and he talks about that if anyone calls upon the name of the Lord, we'll be saved. And as Paul's writing this letter, you can almost see this, this crescendo, this, this climax building up, and Paul finally gets to a point when he begins to think about just how awesome and how powerful God is, he just stops. And this is a point of praise that he writes this letter, it's like, oh, I can't even, what he's really saying. I can't even fathom how great God is. He's so awesome. He's so powerful. He's so majestic. I can't go any further without praising how good he is. I wonder if we can get like that. Now it's like, well, I'm saved. And I, I remember preaching at a service once, and it was a very, very conservative group, and, and I love it. Hard theology, great solid. People are like, amen. They're like, you, you can't say it above this decibel, son. You know? 
Let's not get too loud sometimes. Let's not, let's not raise our hands. Let me tell you, when we start to think about how awesome God is, it should draw us to praise him. And that's what's taking place when Paul's just thinking about God and thinking about God, what God has done. He's like, he deserves every bit of our worship. He deserves every bit of our giving. He deserves everything that we are. It should draw us to a point of, to a point of absolute excitement and worship when we just think about what he's done for us. And so the first thing I want you to understand according to this text is that the majesty of God, it, it's without measure. There's no measurement that we can place. We can't say God's majesty starts here and ends here. There's no beginning and there's no end to his majesty. Look what Paul writes in verse 33. He says, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. He says the depth, he writes that in the singular. He says this depth is so great to his riches and to his, to his wisdom and to his knowledge that no matter how deep you seek to know God, you'll never reach the depth of his glory. You'll never get to the end of God's majesty. You'll never get to the limit of his riches. You'll never get to the exact amount of his wisdom because he's, he's without measure. But what does this mean for you and I? This means that when I pray to a holy God, there's nothing that I can offer him that he cannot handle. Now think about this as a church for a second. We can trust God with our life. God save me. And he saves. I mean, that's what he wrote just last week when you look at Romans chapter 10. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's if you tonight, if you're an unbeliever and you said, Lord Jesus saved me, guess what? He saves you. Forever, he redeems you, he makes you his, he makes you whole, he redeems you. And there is no limit to that. So when Paul writes this and we sit there and say, God, yes, save me, but then the other aspects of our life, we just don't seem to trust him. An all-powerful God who can save our souls can also save your marriage. An awesome God that can save your soul and save you for all eternity can save your family. He can heal a broken heart. He can mend your finances. He can restructure your life. He can give you vision. He can give you hope because that's the depth, the immeasurable depth of a holy God who loves you. And that's why when we understand God and who he is, we can understand just how majestic he is. But I'll tell you, it's absolutely impossible to understand and even fathom the majesty of God without even knowing who he is. And people say, oh, I believe in God. My question is, what do you believe about God? It's not that I just believe in God, but I've placed my faith in God because I can't save myself. I can't redeem myself. I can't do anything outside of him. But I can reach to the immeasurable God who loves me. Paul says, oh, the depth. And he breaks it down to his riches. You can never outspend God. He says, I'll open up the storehouses of heaven. You can't outgive me. You can't outspend me. You can't outgod me. And we try it all the time, don't we? But he's absolutely immeasurable. God is without measure. Oh, the depth of his riches and his wisdom. The Greek word Sophia literally means the absolute brilliance and intelligence of God, that there is no limit to his wisdom. Now, I've met some pretty wise people in the world. I've met a lot more people that think they're wise. But <laughs> I used to think I was wise. I am not, I can promise you that. But isn't it amazing that when we have something going on in our life, we have a problem in our life, we start to go seek people's advice, don't we? And there's nothing wrong with that. We go seek the counsel of others. But if we don't like what that person has to say, so be it like if it's truth and we don't like hearing that, what do we do? Sometimes we migrate to another population so we can seek other advice from someone that might kind of tell us what we want to hear. And we're just waiting for someone to agree with us so we can have this big pity party with each other or kind of find this agreement, and yet we've never sought the wisdom of God in this. There is no depth. There is no limit. There is no border to the wisdom of God. And if we would just trust him with the things of our life, he will always give us his wisdom. It's the majesty of God. 
when you begin to truly fall in love with God, you begin to see his majesty in such a light that you can't help, like Paul, to just praise him. I mean, there are days, literally, in this last couple of weeks we've been here, that we could go sit out on the beach and I see the sunrise. I saw it so many times as a kid. But this week I see it and I'm like, God, you're lifting the sun with your hand. You're rotating the world by your control. And you're letting me witness this because you love me. There is no measure to the majesty of God. And secondly, there is no equal to the majesty of God. I want you to look again at verse 34 and 35. Paul goes into two rhetorical questions here. He kind of shapes them out because he knows that his audience is going to ask these anyway. So Paul writes them in this great knowledge. He goes, for who has the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counsel? Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9 tell us that God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is always bigger in breadth and depth and wisdom and knowledge than us. And Paul says, who has the mind of God? The children of God can approach the mind of God. We can seek the will of God. We can approach God and say, Lord, what is your will? One of the coolest things I love about being here in this stage is every time we get ready to have a worship service, we pray together in the back. And I had the privilege of having Sam pray with me right before the service. And we were just praying, literally, God, your will be done. Let us know what your will is so that we will be faithful to your will. Paul says, who has known the mind, Lord? Who has been his counselor? God has always operated in his wisdom and his knowledge without the counsel of others. It's not like that God's sitting in heaven like, hey, guys, what do you think we should do? I'm kind of flipping this one. You Should we flip a quarter? You know, what do you think? Should we do this? Let's roll the dice. If you've been with us the last few weeks, you understand that God is absolutely sovereign. And that he doesn't operate in time. He operates outside of time. He knows what's going on yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And nothing, absolutely nothing, catches God off guard. His wisdom and his knowledge is absolutely immeasurable and it has no equal. There is no one that God turns to for advice. There is no one that God turns to for guidance because he is God. He has no limit. He has no equal. He has no partner in that sense that can reach over from side to side. He is God, in all of his majesty, in all of his glory, there is no equal. So then why do we put other things in his place? See, when something or someone is majestic, they get our first thoughts. They get our heart. They get us. I want you to go back to me, some of you. You might have to go way back. Stay with me. We're going to do this very tactfully. For the loved one you're with right now, do you remember when you first fell in love? Do you remember when you first started dating? I'll give you a minute. Some of y'all can take a minute. Go ahead. Okay. So you some have to go way back. But you remember that time when you first started dating someone and there was that that gooey kind of sense of, man, I really like this person. I want to impress this person. For guys like me, you know, we'd put on deodorant and we would like shave once in a while and comb our hair and shower and stuff like that. And we would do what we had to do to impress. We wanted to give that person attention. We wanted to show them the very best side of us. We wanted to offer ourselves as the best way we possibly could. Remember that? I tell people all the time that I hate talking on the telephone, but I would talk for hours with Amy on the phone. And we would say nothing. And I'm talking the back days where the phone was attached to a wall and you would just kind of sit and hold that thing to your ear and like three hours later saying, what are you doing? Nothing. What about you? Nothing. <laughs> you know, what are you wearing? Shorts. How about you? Shorts. You know, dumb, goofy conversations. But because I adored her, because I began to love her, I wanted to offer her everything that I had. I wanted to impress her. Do we even think about that in relationship with God? How do we approach God? 
Do we have a love for God in such a way that we do absolutely anything for him? Do we have a relationship with him that is real and genuine to a point that you finally realize in in who you are that you are in desperate need of this holy God and in all of his glory and all of his majesty. He doesn't need you, but he wants you. God wants a relationship, relationship with you even in all of his majesty. (laughs) It's amazing. Paul says, who has God conferred with? Who is his counsel? He goes on to say in verse 35, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? Paul's asking the question, who is God in debt to? Who does God owe? Nobody. He owes us nothing, but he offers us everything. It's ridiculous if you think about it. It's absolutely ridiculous. Of people who don't deserve God, of people who sometimes don't even choose to want to know God, are pursued with that reckless love we sang about today of a holy God who loves us. That's radical love. I just hope you've experienced that. I hope you know what that is. I mean, it's absolutely insane to think about the the, the absolute wisdom and knowledge and power and glory of God and to think that in all of his awesomeness, he still loves you and me. Man, that's awesome. That's ridiculously, recklessly awesome. And all he asks us to do is love him back. Even in all my brokenness and even in all my inability to do these things, he wants me to love him back. And folks, I have come to learn that I love God. Because he loved me first. God's majesty is holy, he's beautiful, he's perfect. It's without measure. He is without equal. There is no other God. If you ever do any study of the book of Isaiah, who's who's my personal favorite Old Testament prophet, because he is sarcastic. If you've ever studied Isaiah, I will tell you, he is sarcastic at times. He writes in chapter 44 and once in chapter 28. He talks about the people that were building gods themselves, god, idols that they could worship. He says, and this is Pete's version, the, the P-E-K-V, I guess we'll call it, the P-K-V, the P-K-O version. Paul, he's writing in Isaiah chapter 40 or 44 and 20. He starts talking, and he goes, he goes, so these guys, man, they go out and they chop a piece of wood. And they stake half the wood and they throw it in the fire to cook their food. And they take some of the wood over here and they sell it to barter with other people. And then they take this little bit of piece of wood left and they carve a god out of it, an idol. They set it on the mantle, but it tilts over because it's incorrect. So they have to prop it up a little bit. And then they pray to this god that it might save them. He says, how ridiculous. He said, because there's already a holy, majestic God that loves you and calls you and has created the world. They even grew the wood that they cut down. It is that God that loves us. How ridiculous that we put something else in his place. God's majesty is absolutely immeasurable and God's majesty has no equal. But I will tell you this, when we fully understand God's majesty, it should draw us into continual praise. Look at verse 36. This is like rich hymnal theology that Paul gives us here. He says, for from him, it means from the very beginning before time, And through him and to him are all things. We're going to read that again together. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. What does this mean for you and I? That means no matter what we face, That means no matter what we deal with in our personal lives, that means no matter what tragedy we deal with, whatever hurt we suffer, whatever pain we experience, there's a God that's in control. That when you sit there at the deathbed of that loved one, God is still God. And you sit there with a broken heart. You sit there and you feel lonely. You're sitting there because you suffer from depression. Or you sit there because you're hurt. Or you sit there because you you don't know what's next. God is still God. And he's never left you, and he never forsakes you, and he never gives up on you. That he just says, I am God, and through all of this, I will love you, and I will hold you, and I will keep you. Because if you called upon my name, I have, and I am, and I will save you. 
And that's what draws Paul to this point of praise. He just can't stop writing anymore. He says, God, you're absolutely amazing to you. Be glory forever and ever. Amen. When is the last time we worshiped God that way? It's like, I will worship God. Oh, it's 12.01. I got to go. It's Sunday morning. Got to beat the Methodist to the church for lunch. When is the last time we just poured out our hearts in absolute praise and adoration because of who God is? You know, sometimes our problem is that we restrict our praise for God for what he does. It's true. When God does something great in our life, we see the hand of God move in a way that, that favors us. Guess what we do? We get excited. And we start, oh, God, you're awesome. Thank you so much. But what about when we hurt and when we suffer? Can we still praise him? Folks, I, I will tell you from personal experience, there are times where I have to make myself get in the car and drive to the Pentagon sometimes. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do it. And then I have to sit there and say, but praise you, God, because you are holy because you are righteous, because you are good, and because you love me in spite of myself, that you love me in spite of who I am. You love me in spite of the way my heart is right now. You still love me. Praise God. Man, if you and I would just worship Jesus this way, if we would just put Jesus first in our life, and if we would allow him to literally be Lord of our life, and we would just take a moment to examine and to look at him like Paul does here in the text, and to look at him in all of his glory, we would cry out like him, Oh, the depth of the riches of your wisdom and knowledge. Praise to God forever. Amen. And I would tell you that if the church would praise God like that, this world would be a different place. Here's my challenge to you as we close. I want to challenge you to literally examine your relationship with God. For the believer, just, just take a moment to rekindle that love affair with Jesus. You know, the reason I brought up this Marriage Connect card from the very beginning of the service it's because a lot of times couples have to rekindle that understanding of why they fell in love in the first place. You know, I, one of the greatest things I learned in my marriage with Amy was I had deployed multiple times to Iraq and, and to Afghanistan. And after a couple of trips, I learned something very quickly. Really, after the very first trip, I learned something. That she is so much better at managing our house with me not there than when I'm there. And I realized after that trip that she was such a phenomenal mom, such a phenomenal parent, such a phenomenal spouse. I realized something. She didn't need me. That can be a scary thought sometimes. She didn't need me. But what was so beautiful is that she still wanted me. And it made me just rekindle an understanding of the reason we fell in love and how depth and how deep and how, how awesome that relationship really became. And, and it still gets better. We still work through things. We still, still struggle through things. But over time, it's just absolutely awesome. I love her more now than I did 25 years ago. And it took some work. Imagine if we would just take some time to rekindle that relationship with the Lord Jesus. Maybe some of us do need to reconnect with him. It's a church. Let's focus on the majesty of God. Let's focus on his awesome glory. Let's focus on who he is. And just think about who he is and what he's done for you. And let's worship him forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we thank Thank you for joining us for this edition of Real Life, Real Hope. I'm Walter West, lead pastor of Anastasia Baptist Church. And our mission as a church is to help people embrace the life-changing truth of Jesus Christ. And that includes you. Christ has a purpose for your life. He has a mission for your life. He wants you to be reconciled with himself. He has a destiny for you. You know, if you want to find out more about that destiny, I invite you to contact us. You can find Anastasia Baptist Church online at www.anastasiachurch.org. Or you can find us uh, 
uh, locally in the St. Augustine, Florida area. We'd love for you to come by and see us personally, or you can call us by telephone. It's area code 904-471-2166. Thank you for joining us, and until next time, God bless you.